Disguised as a homeless woman, the wealthy man's daughter decided to follow her husband. But upon seeing an overturned coffin on the riverbank, Elizabeth Gomez couldn't quite grasp how she had lost control over her life. Just a few years ago, her beloved father was still alive, and everything seemed clear. She helped him manage the family business, and then Nicholas, a diligent newcomer, started catching her eye more and more. Elizabeth, I made you some tea. You're so busy, always running around, said Nicholas, a broad-shouldered, short, dark-haired man, as he began showing her extra care. Nicholas, listen, I appreciate your attentiveness, but you don't need to worry about me. People in the office are already saying you're pursuing me. At first, Elizabeth tried to brush him off. It was hard to explain what felt off about this man. But somehow, she immediately sensed there was something hidden beneath the surface of Nicholas, maybe even two or three layers deep. People say the first impression is the most accurate. Apparently, that's true. But how did she end up convincing herself that this young man was worth a closer look? Now, three months pregnant with triplets, it certainly wasn't the best time to question things. It was easier to keep her eyes closed and pretend everything was fine. After all, she had chosen to marry him herself, and after becoming pregnant, she handed over control of the company since things hadn't been going smoothly. Still, today, the day Elizabeth decided to follow her husband, these memories surfaced, as if waiting for the moment when she would finally take decisive action and start asking herself some uncomfortable questions. Elizabeth glanced in the mirror. Her disguise was flawless. Staring back at her wasn't the well-groomed blonde of medium height with a sleek, neat hairstyle and perfect but subtle makeup. She had transformed into a homeless woman, having deliberately bought second-hand clothes for the occasion, clothes that her husband would never recognize her in. Worn-out autumn boots practically screamed that their owner was indeed down on her luck. She had even cut and dirted the clothes and boots, rolling them in a sandbox far from home so that the neighbors of their elite house wouldn't think she had lost her mind. Foundation two shades paler than her skin made her face look sickly, and her once lively brown eyes were lined with pink pencil, now appearing inflamed. She didn't want to damage her hair, so she hid it under a worn-out scarf she had found in a thrift store, which she had burnt in a few places and washed with other colored clothes to make it look even worse. Good thing it's autumn. I can get away with a long coat, a scarf, and boots. Underneath it all, I'll wear my dad's tracksuit, and the homeless look will be complete, Elizabeth thought. It was her father's tracksuit that had sparked the idea to finally uncover the truth about her husband and see everything with her own eyes. Nicholas had said two weeks ago, Listen, Elizabeth, let's clear out the room where your father used to stay when he visited. I think it's time to let go of the past. Of course, I loved and respected your dad too, but he's gone now, and we need to move forward. Those words suddenly caused her pain. There was no real need to clear out the room where her father had stayed. Their four-room apartment had more than enough space for everyone. Elizabeth lived in one room, her husband in another, and they had decided to turn the living room into a nursery. After all, once she gave birth to triplets, they wouldn't be hosting guests for a while, and the kids would have plenty of space to play in the 40-square-meter room. Nicholas, I'm not ready for that yet. Maybe someday, but not now, she replied. Look, I've always known you were a daddy's girl, and I don't mind, but I'd like to hold the most important place in your heart. Please, let's make this room my office. Ryan would have been happy to know that I'm now taking care of you and our family. It's like he handed me the reins, her husband gently persuaded. All right, I'll think about it, Elizabeth promised, but for some reason, her heart ached. It felt unpleasant again. In a way, Nicholas was right, everything seemed logical. Despite being intelligent and self-sufficient, it was comforting to feel safe behind her husband's protection. If Nicholas was now taking care of everything, she could focus on giving birth to the babies without worrying about anything. But still, a subtle, troubling feeling echoed deep in her soul like ominous music. Don't trust him, don't trust him, her intuition warned, refusing to be silenced. Nicholas didn't lock himself in the bathroom with his phone or come home late from work. Yet, 
he seemed overly fond of his business trips, during which he often turned off his phone. Sometimes she couldn't reach him for half a day. When Elizabeth asked about it, pressing him with specific questions, he would joke, telling her she needed to rest more and focus on the babies, that he wouldn't bother her with details about his trips so she wouldn't feel responsible for her father's company anymore. Nicholas laughed, pretending to care about her, but his eyes were distant, hiding something. There was also a faint scent of another woman on him that drove Elizabeth crazy. If she could have found lipstick stains on his shirt or a picture of another woman on his phone, it would have been easier. The threat would have been clear. But now, she was torn. Was it just her mind playing tricks on her due to hormonal changes, or was she right? Elizabeth had almost calmed herself, deciding her husband was right. It was time to turn her father's room into an office for Nicholas. But as she picked up her father's tracksuit, smoothing the soft fabric and inhaling the familiar scent, something clicked. She realized she needed to stop thinking and start knowing for certain. She wasn't sure where this decision had come from or why it felt so fully formed, but Elizabeth waited until her husband casually remarked, My dear, don't worry. I might turn off my phone again so I don't get distracted and, well, I'll probably be late again. With that, Elizabeth pulled out the homeless disguise she had prepared in advance and decided to follow Nicholas. It was still relatively early, but as she descended in the elevator, she ran into their neighbor. Thankfully, she had thought ahead and brought some old glasses with cracked, cloudy lenses, making her nearly unrecognizable. What are you doing in our building? I haven't seen you before, said Ashley Lloyd, a seasoned housewife and an active member of the local management committee, always keeping a close eye on everything happening around the building. Great, just my luck. What if she recognizes my voice? I'll have to pretend I have a cough. Ashley is terrified of catching anything. Elizabeth thought, suddenly struck by the idea. Fortunately, she actually had a slight cold, so her voice was naturally a bit raspy. Instead of responding, she erupted into a harsh, unpleasant coughing fit. The tactic worked. Ashley shrieked. They come here and spread diseases to decent people. She frantically pressed the button for the nearest floor and darted out of the elevator. Now she'll probably ask the cleaning lady to disinfect the whole elevator and the lobby, Elizabeth mused. Many of their wealthy neighbors were afraid of poor people, the sick, or those from outside the city. Elizabeth had managed to embody all of Ashley's worst fears at once. But Elizabeth's own mother had grown up in an orphanage and shared many life lessons with her before she passed away. Elizabeth had learned that the real dangers in people weren't a lack of money, health, or proper registration. Far more frightening were cruelty, hypocrisy, envy, and indifference. When her parents first met, her father wasn't wealthy at all. His success came later, inspired by the love of his wife and daughter. His own mother had disapproved of his choice, even selling her apartment out of spite so that nothing would be left for him and his poor wife after her death. Elizabeth's grandmother never met her, and with the money she made from selling her apartment, she bought a place for Elizabeth's uncle, who had always been jealous of her father. Because he married her mother, Elizabeth's father lost his family and any inheritance and had to start from scratch. Dad, did you ever regret ruining your relationship with your mother and brother because of me and mom? Elizabeth had asked him when she was old enough to understand. Oh no, Elizabeth, never. Besides, I didn't ruin the relationship. They were just too proud of their city apartment, thinking it gave them the right to look down on others as if it made them better. But that's not true. We're not snails carrying our homes on our backs. Today you live one way, tomorrow another. No one should ever think they're safe from illness or misfortune. Her father later shared that about 10 years after they lost contact, his brother had succumbed to alcoholism and died in a car accident. His wife, who had once acted like a perfect daughter-in-law, promptly claimed her rights and kicked their mother out of the apartment. It was then that she had no choice but to turn to her estranged eldest son for help. Her father held no grudges. He bought his mother a new place to live and supported her financially every month. Yet, out of stubbornness, she refused to see Elizabeth or her mother. 
She continued to advise her son, in her bitter way, to come to his senses and find a worthy woman from a proper family. In the end, she died consumed by hatred, never understanding the lessons life had offered her. Even the betrayal by her perfect daughter-in-law didn't teach her anything. Elizabeth knew where her grandmother was buried and even tended to the grave. Still, it saddened her that she never got to see her grandmother's face in real life, only on the granite headstone. Oddly enough, they resembled each other physically, though Elizabeth's character and temperament were completely different. Everyone has their own fate, after all. In her childhood, her grandmother had been starved by her stepfather, who cruelly called her a cuckoo's child. That must have twisted her spirit, and so she, in turn, felt the need to control and belittle others in order to feel strong. There was no changing that. Elizabeth was grateful that her father never resented his mother and supported her until the end. The neighbors she ran into earlier had brought back the memory of that painful story. When Elizabeth turned 18, another heartbreaking truth came to light. Her mother had been battling cancer for six years, but had never said a word. Sweetheart, I made it. I lived to see you become an adult. I was strong for you and fought as hard as I could, but now I have no strength left. The doctors say I have about two months. I'm sorry for letting you down. Her mother gave her a silver heart-shaped pendant as a birthday gift, the only thing that had been passed down from her maternal grandmother, who had died during childbirth. Believe me, the women in our family have already endured all possible misfortunes. That means you and your children will be fine. Elizabeth had broken down in tears and even gotten angry with her mother. She was outraged that her mother had kept up a cheerful facade, listening to her stories, laughing, cooking, going shopping with her to pick out outfits, never once complaining. If only her mother had told her she was fighting for her life, Elizabeth would never have argued with her about trivial things and would have cherished every moment. Elizabeth had told her mother, Why didn't you tell me? I would have valued every second with you more. Her mother, with a gentle smile, had replied, Listen, you're still young. When you're older, you'll understand why I wanted you to remember me, not my illness, but the real me. Only after her mother's death did Elizabeth discover the full extent of her mother's daily efforts to appear healthy. Her mother had worn a wig and applied thick layers of makeup to hide her illness, even drawing on eyebrows and using fake lashes. For years, she had heroically fought her disease out of love for her family. And it wasn't until Elizabeth grew older that she understood her father had been just as heroic. He had known everything but kept his grief hidden to protect his daughter. At her mother's funeral, Elizabeth asked her father in despair, Why did you both pretend for so long? There was no pretending, her father replied. We just chose to focus on love, so that's what you would remember. Elizabeth understood that her parents had made the right decision, preserving her childhood innocence but it still hurt. Her father had time to prepare for the loss of her mother, while she had not. She had said as much to him that day. You were a child. You wouldn't have been able to bear such a burden. Now, it's time for you to grow up, her father had sighed. And she believed him because she loved him. When her own children were born, Elizabeth knew she would love them and do everything for them, just as her parents had done for her. That model of a loving family was the true inheritance they left her, far more valuable than the business her father had entrusted to her. Even if Nicholas is cheating on me, I won't be alone. I have my three babies, they're my greatest joy. For their sake, I will get through this, Elizabeth thought as she continued to trail her husband, who she had easily found thanks to a tracking app she had installed on his phone. She had been following him for half an hour now, weaving through a maze of apartment blocks. Fortunately, Nicholas favored bright colors. His red hat and scarf stood out starkly against the gray crowd. Elizabeth felt a little foolish, but she had made up her mind. She was determined to learn the truth today. There was no point in waiting until her belly grew too large for her to even walk comfortably. For the first time, Elizabeth felt how chilly the autumn air really was, despite it being the tail end of an Indian summer. Yes, the sun peeked through now and then, casting a warm glow on the falling yellow leaves, but the weather was still damp and raw. 
The wind, though light, cut straight to her bones. The sun provided no warmth, hanging in the sky like a yellow ball, giving the illusion that all was well. The day's weather mirrored Nicholas perfectly. You trust the sunshine, dress lightly, and then find yourself shivering from the cold. Why was he wandering around for so long? Elizabeth hadn't expected such a long walk, otherwise she would have dressed more warmly. She had never worn leaky boots before and didn't realize how quickly the cold would seep in without proper footwear. She was freezing. Come on, go inside already. Elizabeth mentally shouted at Nicholas. As if hearing her thoughts, he slipped into the nearest apartment building near the riverbank. She hurried to catch up just managing to stop the door from closing by wedging her foot in the gap. Inside, she heard the hum of the elevator. Nicholas was headed to one of the upper floors, though which one, she couldn't tell. There was nothing to do but step back outside and rest on a bench. A dull ache had begun to tug at her lower abdomen, and she felt like her body was falling apart. Nausea, never considerate of timing, chose this exact moment to strike, right when she was gripped by anxiety for the future and chilled to the bone. Why on earth did I get myself into this mess? I should have just hired a detective instead of trying to be clever, Elizabeth thought suddenly. She couldn't even understand why she had decided to uncover the truth herself. The impulse had come out of nowhere, and now she was paying the price. She hadn't learned anything yet and had no idea what to do next. She couldn't call a cab looking like this, and waiting for her husband was pointless. If he could switch off his phone for half the day, it wasn't likely that he was just out getting fresh air. At least now she knew he wasn't going to some remote warehouses out of town like he'd been telling her, that excuse about poor cell reception was a lie. Most likely, it was about a mistress. What other reason could he have for sneaking off? He wasn't secretly visiting a sick friend, that's for sure. Still, anything was possible. She needed to be certain before making any final conclusions. She didn't want to regret separating the children from their father over something trivial. For now, all her suspicions were just that, hypotheses. Elizabeth decided to clear her head and wandered along the riverbank. This part of the development was rather shabby, and the promenade was coming to an end. The smooth granite paving stones were disappearing, replaced by piles of construction materials scattered around the half-finished buildings. Yet, she kept walking along the water, intending to find a simple shop where she could buy some more appropriate clothes and take a cab home. Surely, no one would refuse to sell something to a paying customer, even if they looked like a vagrant. She had already spotted a small shopping area in the distance when she suddenly froze. At first, Elizabeth didn't understand what the strange, long black object lying in front of her was. From far away, it looked like a boat, but now, up close, it was unmistakably a coffin, one that had somehow been flipped upside down. Oh great, just what I needed. If this is some kind of sign, I definitely don't want it, Elizabeth thought, shaken. A wave of terror swept over her. What kind of surreal nightmare was this? How had a coffin ended up on the shore of a new construction area? And where was the lid? Horrifying images from crime reports flashed through her mind. Was this a setup for some poor soul who was about to be murdered? Or worse, had it already happened? She had heard that bodies could be transported in coffins to avoid suspicion. Or maybe a cemetery somewhere had been flooded, and this was the grim result, a coffin washed ashore. BRR it was terrifying. Why had she ever gotten herself into this situation? Now, on top of the cold, the nausea, and her family troubles, she had stumbled into a scene straight out of a horror film. Elizabeth felt herself on the verge of fainting. Yes, this is exactly what I needed, she thought sarcastically, to collapse here, in this desolate place, dressed like a homeless person with no ID, and die. To lose the babies right here. When they find me, they'll identify me by my phone. The media will run stories for weeks about how a pregnant businesswoman lost her mind, turned into a vagrant, and died next to a coffin. That'll make for a great photo. Wow, I really know how to create problems for myself. More than anything, Elizabeth wanted to run away, but she forced herself to approach the terrifying object. 
All the while, she kept telling herself, why are you doing this? Just run. If there's a body in there, let someone else find it, someone who isn't pregnant and freezing. Please, let's just get out of here. But her body wasn't listening. She was hypnotized, continuing to inch closer to the overturned coffin. A stick was lying nearby, and Elizabeth picked it up, attempting to nudge the coffin despite her fear. The moment she shifted it, a low groan emerged from inside. Elizabeth collapsed onto the sand, unable to comprehend what was happening. She whispered to herself, Okay, I'll just flip it over so I can tell the police what's inside when I call. Maybe someone can still be helped. The coffin, as luck would have it, was no cheap piece. It seemed to be made of oak, heavy and solid. But Elizabeth had nothing to lose now. She was already filthy from the sand after dropping to the ground in shock. She wasn't exactly presentable before, and now it didn't matter at all. So, she kept trying to turn it over, though the coffin kept slipping from her grip. She deeply regretted not wearing gloves, realizing how foolish it had been to think this would be just a simple walk. After what felt like an eternity, but was probably only ten minutes, she finally managed to flip the coffin. And there, staring back at her with wild, frightened eyes, was a small girl. The child's hair was matted and uncombed, as if no one had cared for it in a long time. In her arms, she clutched a large doll, holding it as though trying to protect it from the entire world. Don't be afraid, I won't hurt you. What's your name? Elizabeth asked softly, her heart breaking at the sight of the abandoned child. Could she be a runaway from an orphanage? Elizabeth wondered. My mom told me that used to happen sometimes. Or maybe she lives nearby, in a troubled family where she was mistreated. Or, could she be one of the child beggars I've heard about? But how did this coffin end up here, and why was she hiding underneath it? These questions raced through Elizabeth's mind, and she hoped the little girl could give her some answers, something that would help. But instead, the child simply lifted a dirty finger to her lips and mumbled something unintelligible. You can't speak? Elizabeth guessed. The girl nodded, then looked deeply into Elizabeth's eyes. She picked up a small stick and drew three wavy lines in the sand, pointing afterward toward the river. Is that a river? Elizabeth guessed. The little girl nodded, clearly pleased that she was being understood. Then, she drew an object floating on the waves and pointed to the coffin. Did you arrive here in this coffin? Elizabeth asked, shocked at the absurdity of the idea. The girl shook her head no and then added a figure inside the coffin, a simple stick figure with a triangular body and a circle for the head, complete with hair. Then she crossed it out. Ah, so the coffin just floated here, and then you found it? Elizabeth asked. The child nodded again and sighed as if to say, finally, this lady gets it. Were you hiding from someone here? Elizabeth wanted to take the girl away as quickly as possible, but she needed some information first. Besides, she had to establish a connection so the girl wouldn't be frightened. The girl just wrote a simple yes in the sand this time, too tired to keep nodding. Next to it, she added, stepfather, scared. Mom died, Joyce ran away. Is your name Joyce? You ran away from your stepfather because your mom died and you're afraid of him? Elizabeth asked. The girl nodded three times in response. Okay, I'm going to call the police. You can't stay on the streets, it's too dangerous. They'll examine you, and if he hurt you, you'll never have to see him again. Elizabeth tried to reassure her. But suddenly, the girl jumped up and tried to run. After a few steps, she tripped over a small rock and fell, hitting the sand with her fists in frustration. When she lifted her face, Elizabeth saw it was drenched in tears. You don't want me to call the police? Please, calm down. I'll do whatever you ask. Just don't run away again, Joyce. Deal? Elizabeth gently stroked her soft curls. The girl wrote again in the sand, Stepfather killed Mom. He'll kill me too. No, that won't happen, Elizabeth said firmly. Here's what we'll do. I'll take you to a warm apartment, and I promise I'll protect you. Okay? 
She lifted the girl into her arms. The girl didn't nod this time, but she also didn't resist. So, Elizabeth decided to take her home for now. With difficulty, she made her way to the road and tried to flag down a car. The drivers didn't stop, casting disdainful looks at the woman who looked like a beggar holding a child. No one wanted trouble, assuming that these two wouldn't be able to pay. Suddenly, Elizabeth remembered Gerald. He had come looking for a job just after her father had passed away. At the time, she was still managing the company. She had been standing outside waiting for a car when she saw security guards pushing out a tall, disheveled blonde man who looked exhausted and horribly dressed. What's going on? Elizabeth asked the staff. Sorry, we thought you had already left, the head of security muttered, looking down. What did this man do? She immediately noticed the look of desperation in the young man's brown eyes and the scar on his forehead. He was still trying to resist, though his energy seemed drained. I didn't do anything. I just asked for a job, the man, clearly homeless, said indignantly. But they keep telling me, buy a license, get some decent clothes, provide recommendations, then we'll see. How am I supposed to get all that if I don't even have a place to live? It's a vicious circle. What am I supposed to do, die on the street so I don't bother anyone? I just want to work honestly. See? He's crazy, the security guard scoffed. He doesn't get that no one owes him anything. Hey, buddy, nothing personal, but this isn't a charity. Don't bring down the mood for decent folks. The guard loosened his grip but kept pushing the man off the premises. Wait a minute, Elizabeth interjected. Didn't Dennis just leave the night watchman position? No license required there. She turned to the homeless man and added, but keep in mind, the pay's not great. Here's some money for clothes. Come back tomorrow. Her father had often said, trust people, but verify. This was her way of doing both. If he was a scammer, he'd disappear with the money. But if he genuinely needed work, he'd grab the opportunity. Oh, you'll never see him again, the security guard lamented. Maybe not, Elizabeth said calmly, but if he comes back, let him stay in the staff room. There's a couch there. Understood, the guard sighed. Everyone in the company knew it was as pointless to argue with the boss's daughter as it had been with her late father. Elizabeth was known for her stubbornness, but she was also fair and never treated anyone poorly. It was that moment with Gerald that Elizabeth remembered now. He had risen up since then, now working in security for the same firm. He'd even managed to buy a used car. Surely, he wouldn't refuse to help her out in her current situation. After all, walking home with the little girl in her arms was out of the question. The child was freezing even more than Elizabeth, and both of them were utterly exhausted. The walk would take at least 40 minutes, and that was at a brisk pace, something Elizabeth could not manage right now. Her belly was starting to ache again, and the last thing she needed was to trigger a miscarriage. Calling Gerald seemed like the perfect, timely solution. Of course, no problem. I won't ask any questions. I'm grateful to you for life, Gerald said, smiling. He mentioned he'd arrive in about 20 minutes after asking his replacement to cover for him. Elizabeth couldn't help but think that the phrase for life had taken on a whole new meaning today. She had discovered a frightened little girl in what had been a coffin, truly a coffin of life. Once they reached home, Elizabeth offered Gerald some tea. He politely declined, saying, No, really. I don't need anything. If you need any help, I'm always happy to assist. I'd even risk my life for it. You don't have to explain anything. Thank you, Gerald. Please don't look at me like that. I'm not in any trouble. It's just a strange situation that I can't explain right now. I promise Joyce, she said, nodding at the little girl. Gerald tried not to show just how surprised he was. How had the owner of the company ended up in such an odd situation with this child? As far as he knew, she didn't have any kids yet. But that was none of his business. He felt grateful to have been able to return her kindness in some way. If it weren't for her, he might have died in a puddle under a fence or in a dumpster. So, 
It felt good to be needed for once. If your husband doesn't welcome the girl, you are welcome to stay at my place. I rent an apartment, he blurted out, then immediately blushed. How could he have thought that Elizabeth would leave her spacious home to stay in his hovel? If he had fallen for her back then, it was clear he had no chance. What a foolish thing to say. Gerald reddened and apologized. Well, anything can happen in life. We'll keep that in mind, she said, not angry in the least. Elizabeth was indeed a strange woman. Typically, people in her position didn't show compassion for anyone. But she was different. She had always helped any employee, regardless of their rank. Her husband, on the other hand, was a scoundrel. He stole money, and the company was declining rapidly. They'd cut a third of the staff, yet Nicholas kept buying more expensive cars. It was unlikely that his wife knew about all of this, but gossiping felt inappropriate. It had only been a few months. What would happen next with Nicholas? What if he truly drove his wife to bankruptcy? She might need help then. That's what Gerald had really meant. Still, it was no reason to frighten her. Gerald knew he might be mistaken. He hadn't studied economics, but he could spot a rogue from a mile away. Sometimes, that was enough. Gerald, call me if you ever run into any trouble. People should help each other, Elizabeth said as they parted ways. Elizabeth felt a pang of guilt as she apologized again for scaring Gerald with her appearance and potentially dirtying his car. But he only reddened further. Did it even matter if the car was dirty? Maybe he had been dreaming for a long time to do something for her. Sweeping out sand was hardly a problem, especially since he wouldn't even have that car if it weren't for her. Her homeless look hadn't frightened him at all. In fact, Elizabeth looked beautiful to him, even in her strange attire. But she had always been unique. So, Gerald just mumbled something vague in response and left. Who could tell such a story? Once Gerald was gone, Elizabeth took a bath and washed Joyce. She ordered several outfits and shoes in the girl's size from a quick delivery store. She didn't want to go anywhere. Plus, what could she dress Joyce in? They shared some tea together afterward, and Elizabeth watched with relief as the little girl ate with gusto, devouring her food. That was a good sign. The biggest challenge, however, was with the doll. Joyce refused to part with it for anything, but Elizabeth eventually managed to convince her that the doll needed a bath too. It would feel better that way. While the doll dried, Elizabeth gave Joyce a piece of paper and asked a few more questions. She discovered that Joyce's mother had owned a clothing business, but now her stepfather was planning to take control of it. Joyce suspected that he had poisoned her mother and would do the same to her. He had even threatened her when he was drunk. Elizabeth learned that the girl was eight years old, but hadn't been to school since her mother passed away. Her stepfather had switched her to homeschooling. Elizabeth couldn't tell whether Joyce had lost her ability to speak from birth or if it had happened after her escape or her mother's death. But asking too many questions felt risky. The child was already so tired. So, she tucked Joyce into bed and sang her a lullaby, reassuring her that everything would be all right for all good people, especially for Joyce. She prepared a room for the girl where her father had once lived, grateful that she hadn't had the chance to clean out the bed or convert it into an office for her husband. Well, now I know the name of her late mother, the name of that scoundrel stepfather, and even the name of the tailor shop. I'll find that lowlife and deal with him. But what to do about my husband? Corner him and ask directly what he was doing in that high-rise? No, that would be foolish. If he's cheating, he'll lie. I'll just act like nothing happened and come up with something about Joyce, Elizabeth thought. When Nicholas returned, she told him that Joyce was Gerald's daughter. Her mother was in the hospital, and Gerald had asked her to take Joyce in for a couple of days. I'll fire him. Has he lost all sense? Not only did we hire that bum, but he's also asking for favors. And not from me, but from my wife. Nicholas exclaimed, indignantly. No, please don't fire him. I sometimes call all the employees to check in on them. So, I just brought him in for a candid chat. Gerald has nothing to do with it, Elizabeth replied. 
She had already arranged with Gerald to confirm that Joyce was indeed his daughter. What do you mean you're calling employees? Are you checking up on me behind my back? You don't trust me? Nicholas clearly looked frightened, but he tried to act as if he was merely outraged by his wife's suspicions. Suddenly, Elizabeth realized, it seems he's hiding something at work too. It turned out that her hypothesis about an affair wasn't the only problem that might come crashing down on her. What does checking have to do with anything? If I didn't trust you, I would hire a detective to find out why you disappear for entire days and turn off your phone, Elizabeth replied, forcing a smile. In truth, there wasn't really anything to hire a detective for. Nicholas had become bolder and was giving her less and less for household expenses. She said this to test Nicholas's reaction. He grew even more frightened, starting to stammer and paling. Listen, I don't want someone else's kids. We'll have our own, and I'll love them. So Gerald can figure things out with his daughter and her mother. You know, it's unpleasant to say, but this is still my apartment. So Joyce is going to live here for now. If Gerald were to move in, I could understand your outrage. But how is a child in my apartment bothering you when you're hardly ever home late and you've stopped noticing me? Elizabeth was surprised at herself for suddenly scolding her husband. She had never caused a scene before, but the tension from the events of the day had built up so much that she felt she would explode from within if she didn't vent her emotions. Elizabeth, what's gotten into you? I've never seen you like this. You're acting like a street vendor. Well, fine, let this joy stay for now. But you should see a doctor. Maybe they'll prescribe you something to calm down. Nicholas became sarcastic and cruel as soon as she showed him who was the boss in the house. It was a very bad sign. But she didn't have the strength to think about everything at once. First, she needed to deal with Joyce's stepfather. A couple of days passed, and Joyce adapted to the apartment. She liked the room that had belonged to Elizabeth's late father. They went shopping and bought toys, so now the girl was serving them tea from the child's tea set they had bought. She also tried to help around the house, getting up in the morning and waiting until Nicholas left for work to make sandwiches for Elizabeth. It was clear that Elizabeth's husband didn't sit well with her. If she was so afraid of her stepfather, it was understandable that other men might frighten her too. In the meantime, Elizabeth looked into this man and learned that Charles had indeed put his late wife's tailor shop up for auction. It had actually belonged to Joyce's mother. Interestingly, he hadn't reported the girl missing to the police and seemed completely unconcerned about it. So, it could be confidently said that he was a despicable person. However, Elizabeth still had no evidence that he had poisoned his wife or that he intended to harm his stepdaughter. She didn't know how to handle the situation, so she decided to purchase the tailor shop that was up for sale as a pretext to meet Charles and learn more about him, which would help her figure out how to proceed. Nicholas, I was thinking that I should start some small women's business. I found a tailor shop that I'd like to buy, she said to her husband. Joyce was thrilled by this and even drew a picture of her mother, a dress on hangers, and a heart beside it. She wrote that her mother loved her tailor shop very much and would be happy if it went to Elizabeth. Are you out of your mind? Spending money on some toy, he scoffed. Maybe you should just wait until your hormones settle down? Elizabeth looked closely at her husband. Why is he so furious? She noticed the veins on his temples pulsing as if they might burst at any moment. It was just a small amount for their income. Did she not have the right to manage her own money? So, she asked Nicholas that directly. Listen, I didn't want to worry you, but things aren't going that well. We have very little cash flow. As he spoke, Nicholas began to make up stories, claiming that Elizabeth's late father had left the company with almost debts. But she was aware of the situation, she knew the company was doing just fine and even thriving. She pointed out to her husband that he was mistaken and that there was money in the company. Ultimately, with great reluctance, Nicholas scraped together the needed amount, explaining that he had made large purchases in advance, which was why there was no cash available. Elizabeth didn't voice her thoughts, 
but in reality, there were only two possibilities, either Nicholas was hopelessly foolish and dragging the company down, or he was intentionally deceiving her. Both scenarios were equally bad, and she would need to deal with it. Thus, while trying to check if her husband was having an affair, she ended up discovering that he was on the verge of bankruptcy. What news? Meanwhile, she couldn't work much because she was going through a complicated pregnancy. What to do? Do what you can, even if it's just little by little. The universe will catch up. It loves heroes and heroines, her father would have said. So, she decided to do everything she could each day and see where it led. The tailor shop was purchased, and if something went wrong, it could serve as a source of income for a while. She resolved to conduct an audit of the main company that week and figure out what her husband was trying to hide. At that moment, Joyce brought over another drawing, this time depicting her stepfather in black marker, with the caption, Elizabeth needs protection. You know, little one, you're right. It would be a good idea to hire security, Elizabeth thought of Gerald again. You have no idea how timely your call is. I just got laid off, they let me go today. It turned out that Nicholas had indeed found a way to fire the former drifter. He sought revenge for the fact that the man hadn't taken Joyce, whom Nicholas considered his daughter. Well, I just bought a big tailor shop, and I'll need someone to keep watch at night. I won't skimp on your salary. Elizabeth replied happily. Gerald said, you know, I don't want to gossip, but your husband is acting strangely. He's firing a lot of people, not just me. And he's very irritated by Joyce. He said that because of me, that annoying girl is getting in the way. I thought you should know. Gerald had even prepared a recording on his phone so that Elizabeth wouldn't think he was just angry at his employer because of the firing and was venting. You did the right thing. I'm glad you said something. And be careful at the shop. The former owner is a dangerous type, Elizabeth warned. She knew she could rely on Gerald. He was no longer the drifter he once was. If it weren't for the scar, he could even be considered handsome, tall, blue-eyed, and very dependable and kind. Why did I ever follow Nicholas's lead, she wondered. At first, she thought she was simply choosing a loving and deeply devoted man who she liked a bit. She believed he would be a reliable husband. Her father had blessed their marriage. Yes, perhaps it was because of her dad that she hurried into it. He had been mentioning more frequently that his heart was playing tricks on him and that it was time for him to join his wife, but he wanted to see his grandchildren first. Elizabeth felt she could handle everything else. She was smart, strong, kind, and talented. She had inherited the best qualities from her parents. Yes, that was it. That's when she decided to marry quickly for her father's sake. Nicholas was there, and she thought he was quite a decent option although there was something odd about him. But after all, there are no perfect people. Dad, I've fallen in love with someone. She wanted to cheer her father with her marriage. Really? He exclaimed happily. Yes, but he's not wealthy or successful, just a clerk in our company, Elizabeth said. Well, this is a matter of experience. People are not judged by their money or connections either. I will accept any choice you make. Do you love him? Her father asked. She was glad then that he had started to lose his sight shortly before his death, otherwise he would have seen right through her lie. But she said yes, she loved him, and her father was convinced that the heart does not deceive. Thus, she had trapped herself. She reassured herself that it would make things easier for her dad. After all, her father would not live to see his grandchildren or even hear about her pregnancy. He had gifted her this apartment before the wedding, and she had arranged a room there so that her father could visit often. Nicholas pretended to adore his father-in-law, as the old man had ensured his rapid rise up the career ladder. Still, he warned Elizabeth. Daughter, I understand that traditionally, men have been the heads of families and all that. But believe me, there have always been all kinds of men and women throughout history. Your husband is an average man. Try not to relinquish full control. Okay, Dad, she promised. Then, when she got pregnant, she hoped that her husband would support her for a short period. 
Although he was not the sharpest tool in the shed, it wasn't that difficult to keep a business afloat if only Nicholas had been a decent man. And now, it seemed that was far from the truth. Her husband had no intention of preserving the company. He was firing employees and siphoning off funds. All of this was done deliberately, as the results of the audit had shown. She was already considering discussing his removal from the company when, late one evening, Gerald called. Elizabeth, there's a guy here trying to set the shop on fire. I've tied him up for now. What should we do with him? Okay, send me a picture. Nicholas hadn't returned yet, so Elizabeth figured she could rush to the tailor shop and decide what to do next in person. Of course. In less than a minute, she was looking at a photo of Joyce's stepfather on her phone. How timely had her little one's warning been? Elizabeth called a taxi and headed to the tailor shop. Her husband's phone was off, so she decided not to notify him. And why did you do this, handsome? Elizabeth asked Gerald to play the role of an unstable person who was ready to take out Joyce's stepfather at the behest of a bloodthirsty property owner. You've picked the wrong people to mess with. Do you know who I am? Elizabeth stepped into the role of a clan leader or something along those lines. What? Just take him out and be done with it? Gerald suggested with a bloodthirsty look. Perhaps, since he's not saying anything. But it's better to sedate him and bury him alive, let him suffer. I think I have a coffin somewhere in storage, a nice one with soundproofing. You'll take the body to the cemetery in it tomorrow morning, as usual, and Elizabeth recalled her find on the shore, deciding to scare Charles even more. Wait, I'll tell you everything. The bald, scrawny man with bulging eyes confessed that he had insured the business. If it burned down this year, he would collect money for it again. Listen, friend, you have two options, a grave or prison. I know you killed Catherine and were planning to do the same with her daughter. We have long arms, Elizabeth said. An idea struck her. She needed to hasten the confession process or the scoundrel would wiggle out again. How did you know I poisoned her? The man asked, surprised. That's none of your business. But if you try to lie again, remember, I will find you anywhere. Gerald threatened, rubbing his scar ominously. In reality, he had been beaten up while he was homeless, but with a little imagination, he could be mistaken for a thug, especially when he was diligently portraying a villain, like now. I understand. Call the police, and I'll tell everything. When the police arrived, Elizabeth filed a report for arson and attempted murder of the guard for illegal profit. Gerald made sure that Charles didn't forget to confess to his wife's murder. The beast was promptly taken into custody. However, he was so frightened that he really thought they were going to bury him alive that he was actually relieved to end up in jail. Out of all the women, why did I have to sell the shop to this one? She's a total monster. That's what Charles thought at the moment of his arrest, believing he had gotten off easy. What are you doing hanging out with that Gerald? Her husband asked discontentedly when he returned about 20 minutes before Elizabeth arrived. Actually, he saved my shop. And you, as usual, weren't answering your phone, Elizabeth replied. I don't like him, Nicholas muttered. And why is that? Elizabeth asked. Strangely enough, her husband had stopped criticizing the vagabond. She was surprised. What did Gerald know about him that made Nicholas afraid? Yes, because he's overstepping, and you are my wife. Nicholas said evasively, adding, let him take his girl and stay out of my sight. Or do all women leave him? What does that have to do with anything? Elizabeth asked, surprised. Nicholas clearly knew something about Gerald, but didn't want to share. She decided it would be simpler to find out directly. The next day, she said, listen, Gerald, Nicholas told me everything. She left you, didn't she? In reality, Elizabeth was tired of the silence and decided to corner Gerald with her husband's casual remark. You should ask your husband, Gerald said, surprised and growing somber. His eyes darkened, but he pretended everything was fine, otherwise, Elizabeth would continue to pry. He didn't want to tell her that Nicholas was seeing the woman he once wanted to marry. He had courted Rebecca, 
took on side jobs, and the shop assistant seemed to have a soft spot for him. But in the end, Nicholas had stolen her away. He overheard their conversation. And what about that poor loser? He seems really smitten with you. Nicholas asked Rebecca. That was when Gerald remembered him. The response from his beloved struck him to the heart. Yeah, is he even a fiancé? Just a fool. Sometimes I get bored, so I don't push him away. It was a complicated and unpleasant topic, which is why he hadn't wanted to talk about it yet. No man would enjoy recounting such a story in detail. Let Elizabeth's husband figure it out for himself. And who was he? Nobody, as always. That's how life had played out. He would never have a wife like that. For some reason, Elizabeth ended up with a cheater and a fraud. Meanwhile, things at the atelier were going well. Even though Elizabeth was pregnant, her business acumen hadn't left her. Often, she brought Joyce to work with her so the girl wouldn't be bored at home. She expanded the staff, bought higher quality fabric, and good patterns. There were plenty of orders because she didn't mark up prices as much as other ateliers. Essentially, clients could order a complete set of clothing tailored to their individual sizes for just a bit more than they would pay in a store. However, they needed to buy a whole capsule, at least 20 items, and colors that the stylist helped select. It was genuinely a unique and advantageous offer. As a result, she managed to attract clients through word of mouth. Elizabeth had already spoken to her husband about how poorly he managed the company and that he needed to leave. He agreed but asked for some time to hand over the affairs. Fine, take your time, but you've gotten bold, pulling money from the turnover of my atelier, she told him. What? Do you really think I'm a cold-hearted fraud? I love you. I want to spend my life with you and our children. I never thought you'd think of me like that, he replied. Elizabeth herself didn't understand how Nicholas managed to sweet-talk her like that. She was feeling unwell and wanted desperately to believe that he was just a bit clueless and not actually deceiving her. There was still no concrete evidence of an affair, so she decided to bury her head in the sand and let things be, at least until she felt better. However, her morning sickness served as a constant reminder that nothing was improving. She could end up in the hospital at any moment, and it was simply too dangerous to fight with her husband if it turned out he was a dangerous fraud. So, Elizabeth preferred to cloud her usually clear thoughts and not fully dwell on the unpleasant conclusions that were just begging to be drawn. This sometimes happens with women, especially when they're pregnant. They want to retreat into their little bubble and hope the rogues will temporarily become good and kind, allowing for a breather. Thus, Elizabeth didn't dare to confront Nicholas head-on. A week later, she was indeed taken to the hospital with the threat of a miscarriage. She could lose all three babies at once. At that moment, there was no time to think about infidelity or fraud. Meanwhile, Nicholas was rubbing his hands together. Now he had a fully functioning atelier, and that was quite convenient. Unfortunately for Nicholas, Elizabeth had appointed Gerald as the manager. Although Gerald didn't understand much about such large-scale operations, he made sure that nothing changed and that the business continued to operate as usual. Uh, Gerald, we should cut back on purchases, Nicholas tried to convince him. There was no such order, Gerald replied curtly. But you don't understand anything about business. My wife can't think straight right now. You need to listen to me, Nicholas pressed on. You don't understand anything about business either. Look at what you've done to the company. People have nothing to pay with. And that's just in six months. Gerald shot back. How dare you? I will fire you. Nicholas exclaimed indignantly. The former drifter just shrugged. Whatever happened, happened, but he wouldn't let Elizabeth or her business be harmed. She had trusted him, and Gerald would not let her down. For the time being, he took Joyce with him, so the little girl was now going to work with him. Elizabeth didn't want to leave her child with Nicholas, knowing he didn't know how to care for the kids and didn't love the girl. Gerald seemed to be managing his responsibilities as a father. Joyce even wrote him a note saying, You're nice, thank you. Take me to Elizabeth. 
Gerald hesitated. Should he do that? He tried to refuse, but the girl wrote many notes asking, Did she die like mommy? Followed by a question mark. She even had a meltdown, something Joyce had never done before. She was an exceptionally calm child. So, Gerald called Elizabeth to inform her that he was forced to bring the girl. Of course. If she's that worried, just come over, Elizabeth said in a weak voice. So, Gerald didn't bring up the conflict with her husband just yet. The little girl was tense. She had thought until the last moment that she was being deceived. She was sure that something was wrong with her kind aunt, who had saved her, or that perhaps she was no longer in this world and had gone to join the angels like her mother. Elizabeth recalled her own mother and, to hide her pallor, applied some blush and did her makeup. She even dressed up so that Joyce wouldn't worry about her anymore. Are you alive? To Elizabeth's surprise, the girl didn't need paper and a pencil. Joyce spoke her first word since experiencing her mother's death. Elizabeth held her close, crying tears of joy, and for a moment forgot about the dark clouds looming overhead. Meanwhile, Gerald, who had quietly returned to the atelier, overheard a very intriguing conversation between Nicholas and Rebecca. She had come to him, thinking Gerald would be away at the hospital for half a day. The couple didn't expect him to simply leave the girl with Elizabeth for a while and return to work himself. So, let's hurry and take the money from the atelier too. Then we can live in Greece for a few years. I love the sea. Rebecca exclaimed. You know, sweetheart, it's not that simple. My wife is suspicious and will be removing me from management. Plus, the atelier is protected by her loyal dog, your ex, Nicholas replied. That drifter? He's completely useless. Just bribe him, grease his palm. You're an experienced con man, you've told me that yourself. This isn't your first wealthy wife. Rebecca laughed. The problem is that he's incorruptible. A real idiot. I don't know what to do with him, Nicholas sighed. Listen, if he didn't want a bribe, he would have turned you into your wife long ago, Rebecca said. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Maybe he just wants more money than I offered? Nicholas pondered. Of course. All people in this world are the same. They want freebies and as much as possible. This one just wants to put on a noble face while playing a bad hand. The red-haired woman with an impressive bust instructed her lover. Gerald quietly slipped away so as not to be noticed. And it was a mistake. If he had stayed just a little longer, he would have learned that if he refused the bribe, a gang of tough guys would put him in the hospital for a long time. Meanwhile, Nicholas would sort out his affairs. So, Gerald foolishly refused a large bribe and didn't keep an eye on his surroundings. That very evening, some punks kicked him in the kidneys and liver so badly that he ended up in the clinic for a long time. You're lucky you don't have a concussion, the doctor said. Well, there's nothing to shake around in my head. Gerald spat out another tooth and bitterly thought that he had wasted too much time not telling Elizabeth everything he knew about her husband. Now she was in danger, her husband would strip her bare, and Gerald wouldn't be able to help. To make matters worse, he was illegally fired from the atelier, and he couldn't call Elizabeth. Nicholas was now kindly answering his wife's calls himself. Has Gerald shown up? Elizabeth asked her husband more than once. Not yet, I tell you if he did. What can you expect? All drifters are the same, no matter how much you feed them or try to tame them, they'll run away eventually. This one lasted a long time, Nicholas sighed with feigned sympathy. Elizabeth, something happened to Gerald. I don't trust that guy, the girl said when Elizabeth's husband left the room. I don't trust him either, Elizabeth sighed. Only a few days later did she discharge herself from the hospital and learn that Gerald had disappeared. He's really nice, Joyce added. I know, Elizabeth agreed with her. Shall we go for a walk in the park? It's winter now, we should feed the birds. Let's go, the girl exclaimed excitedly. They walked through the park, scattering the purchased seeds, when suddenly Joyce ran quickly toward a bench. Gerald. Gerald. 
Elizabeth didn't immediately recognize Gerald and the sad man with a bandaged head and a cast. He was also feeding the birds. Gerald, what happened? Why did you disappear? Gerald didn't understand at first where she had come from. First, he saw Joyce's joyful face. The girl threw herself around his neck. Then he saw the woman he felt very guilty towards. This time, he decided to tell her everything. To make sure Joyce wouldn't overhear anything, they went into a cafe with a separate play area for children. The kids were screaming so loudly that Joyce wouldn't be able to hear anything no matter how hard she tried. Joyce happily joined in the games. Please forgive me, Elizabeth. I'm just a mindless fool. That gang should have killed me, the idiot, Gerald began his story. This time, he methodically laid out everything he knew. Nicholas is a marriage con artist, and he has a mistress. He's already drained money from the first business, and that's why he's afraid you'll dismiss him. There's probably nothing left in the atelier now. And it's all because of me, I let you down. You know, for some reason, only the people who truly love me ever say that they've let me down. Elizabeth recalled her mother's words and sadly thought that those who truly betray others never think to admit it or feel remorse. You're not mad at me? Gerald was surprised. I need to be angry at myself, Elizabeth replied thoughtfully. She couldn't imagine how bad and despicable everything really was. Yet, there were lingering worries in her mind. She had known something was off. But she had been hiding from her thoughts. After this conversation, it felt both painful and relieving at the same time. As if she had undergone a quick operation and had the abscess removed, which would no longer burst inside her body and spoil the rest of her life. She took her phone and called her father's best friend, his trusted lawyer, without delay. Benjamin Morton? Hello, this is Elizabeth. I'm in a difficult situation, and I don't know what to do. Perfect. This is exactly the kind of case I specialize in, the old family friend replied cheerfully. He was already waiting for her in his office that same day, although he had to postpone several scheduled meetings with very important people. During the divorce, the audacious Nicholas showed no mercy to his pregnant wife, whom he had deceived, trying to claim half of the assets. But Benjamin merely laughed and said, Young man, believe me, you are one of the most inexperienced con artists. I'm going to make short work of you. You really should consider doing something else. You don't know how to pull off a proper scam. We'll see about that, old man. Nicholas retorted angrily, realizing that his prize was slipping away. It turned out that Elizabeth's late father's company was organized in such a way that the funds Nicholas considered a fortune were merely a small cash reserve accumulated over six months of work. The business was structured so that every six months, only a certain amount could be spent or withdrawn, and then the next amount could be accessed in the following six months. In his time, Elizabeth's father had entrusted his friend and lawyer to set things up this way. Nicholas was frustrated to realize that he had stolen only pennies when he could have taken much more. Furthermore, he was now homeless and had to give the lawyer a promissory note to return the stolen funds. If he hadn't done that, he would have been sent to prison for fraud. He had no doubt that the elderly lawyer would keep his word. Yeah, you're just a loser. And even worse than Gerald. And I was foolish enough to bet on you. Rebecca had returned to work at a liquor store, hoping to find a more fortunate fate with her looks. Elizabeth, on the other hand, asked her father's lawyer to manage the firm while she was pregnant. She requested that he stay for at least three years, as the babies would need all her attention in the early days. Well, I'll do my best. But I'll need a reliable person. I've wanted to ask about your friend for a while. You know, he looks just like me when I was younger. Benjamin even showed her a photograph of himself. Indeed, Gerald resembled him like two peas in a pod, except that he was a bit taller. Well, actually, he's not my fiancé, Elizabeth said, blushing. I've lived a long time, so I can see where this is headed. He seems like a dependable guy. So, how do you know him? Elizabeth recounted everything she remembered. 
Gerald had been in an orphanage since his teenage years after his mother passed away. Later, he was given housing by the government but was cheated by con artists. Ever since then, he had been struggling until Elizabeth hired him. Well, I would like to work with Gerald if you don't mind, the lawyer said thoughtfully. He didn't tell Elizabeth that 28 years ago, his mistress became pregnant and was very upset when he refused to marry her. Although Benjamin offered to support her and adopt the child, she disappeared that same day. She left, and he could never find her again, no matter how hard he tried. It was hard to believe that his son had survived, but Diana Howard indeed passed away around the time Gerald was a teenager. He knew that for certain because he had been keeping track of her fate. Gerald had been adopted for a year, and so he decided not to interfere in his life. After all, he couldn't know that those people returned Gerald to the orphanage because he seemed sullen, uncommunicative, and generally sad. Only when he got to know Gerald better and realized that this was indeed his son did he tell Elizabeth and Gerald about it. He admitted that he had no other children. Clearly, fate had punished him. I wasn't even married back then. I loved your mother. What a foolish scoundrel I was. Benjamin lamented over his past sins. You know, Dad, my mother was waiting for you to find us. Even on the last day before she took that bus to work and had the accident, she told me that if you ever found me, I should reconcile with you. We were both wrong, and we were young and foolish, making rash decisions. So, I will do as Mom asked, Gerald said. He believed there was no point in judging an unfamiliar person as he had never walked in his shoes. This way, he had a chance to help Elizabeth. Gerald dreamed that they would adopt Joyce and he would marry Elizabeth, becoming a father of many. For such a future, forgiving his father was not difficult at all. Especially since Benjamin was genuinely remorseful and didn't seem like a bad person. A year later, when Gerald and Elizabeth got married, they adopted Joyce and were raising three healthy boys, Anthony, Christopher, and Jack. They were watching TV when the host announced that last year, a shipment of very expensive coffins made from genuine mahogany was being transported by ferry. Due to the negligence of a funeral service employee, the entire batch had floated away and scared the population for a long time. Almost everything had been recovered, except for one that disappeared mysteriously. The news was titled The Coffin That Drifted Away. The host mentioned that this could also be seen as a good sign. Perhaps someone who saw that coffin had escaped death. So, is this the one? Gerald asked his wife, recalling that Elizabeth had told him about her encounter with Joyce. Definitely. It seems the host is right. Who knows what Nicholas was capable of, she hugged Gerald. I was alive then, but I might as well have been dead. My life had no meaning, so the coffin ended up being lucky for me, Gerald said. Well, since we're so lucky, maybe we should have another little lawyer someday, he winked at his wife. Well, we should wait a few years, but I'm not opposed to it. The doctor said I'm a lucky mom and can have many more kids. Elizabeth laughed. Gerald thought that whatever his wife decided, so be it. He already considered all four children as his own. If you enjoyed the story, please support it with a like and a comment. All the best to you.